Good morning and welcome to Grace Presbyterian Church. We have a few announcements before we get started. We would like to extend a welcome to all this Lord's Day, especially our visitors. If you're visiting with us for the first time or if you haven't filled out one yet, we would love for you to fill out one of the connection cards. It's found in the seat back pocket just right in front of you there. And either put it in the uh, bag during offering or put it in the offering box in the back. Or you can just hand it to an elder or deacon. Uh, we'd like to point out our weekly events. First of all, this evening at 5 p.m., we have our evening divine service. Uh, our weekly prayer meeting is every Wednesday. This Wednesday, it's from 6.30 to 7.30, as usual. And there will be a brief time of teaching from the Psalms and then a guided prayer. The men and women's Bible studies, the Monday evening women's study will be taking this week off. So there will not be the meeting tomorrow night. The Wednesday daytime women's study will be meeting as usual this coming Wednesday. That'll be at 9.30 a.m. at Karen Bolden's house. And the Monday evening men's Bible study is meeting tomorrow. It's at 7 p.m. at Pastor Nathan's house. And they will be discussing chapter 3 of Disciplines of a Godly Man. Our family Bible studies are meeting this Friday, March the 18th. They're hosted by the Ellis family and the Ellison family and the Northcuts. And each group begins at 5.30 p.m. with a potluck dinner to, together, and the study itself starts at 6.30. And for more information, please contact any of these families or the leaders, and they'll be happy to tell you more about it. Uh, this week, we will be looking at chapters 19 through 21 of Gentle and Lowly, which is Lesson 9 in the study guide. Also, on 4-23, that's April the 23rd, the King of Kings PCA Church will be hosting a women's conference. So for any of the ladies thinking about going up to Goodyear for this conference, just remember that tomorrow, March the 14th, is the end of the early bird rates to register. There's more information on the church email this week and in our church's Facebook group. And finally, we have the proof copy of the directory in the back. And check to see that your info is correct. Uh, if there's any issues, please contact uh, the church office this week. All right. All that being done, let us now quiet our hearts as we prepare for worship. Preparation for worship this morning comes from Psalm chapter 19, verses 7 through 9. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. We are gathered in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Laud him, all you peoples. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Rejoice and be glad in it. So let's express our joy in Christ's salvation. Please take your hymnals, turn to number 122. God, all nature sings thy glory. Please stand. Oh, 
Amen. Let's pray. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who alone does wondrous things. Blessed be his glorious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with his glory. And our Heavenly Father, we now come before you this morning as your people, whom you've called out of the darkness of this world into your marvelous light. And we praise you, Jesus Christ, our Savior, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made us a kingdom of priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. And we praise you, Holy Spirit, for through you God's love has been poured into our hearts. Oh, bless our worship this morning for your praise as well as for our encouragement in Christ's name. Amen. We ask that you remain standing while we confess truth together. Our affirmation of faith is the Apostles' Creed, the most ancient of church documents, declaring the truth of the Trinity. Let us now proclaim this truth together. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. And we ask that you remain standing a moment longer for a reading from God's holy, infallible word. Today's reading comes from Proverbs chapter 12 verses 15 through 28. 
Today's reading in Proverbs deals extensively with what we say and a bit with what we listen to. Our speech matters, and far too often we are not as careful as we should be. Words have the power to do great harm and to heal. We know this to be true both from Scripture and from experience. Yet so often we find ourselves falling short. James the Apostle tells us, No human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. So what are we to do? Look to Christ. The Apostle Peter tells us at the end of chapter 2 of his first epistle, Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was there deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. Now, let us turn to the word of the Lord in Proverbs chapter 12, starting in verse 15. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man listens to advice. The vexation of a fool is known at once, but the prudent ignores an insult. Whoever speaks the truth gives honest evidence, but a false witness utters deceit. There is one whose rash words are like sword thrusts, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Truthful lips endure forever, but a lying tongue is but for a moment. Deceit is in the heart of those who devise evil, but those who plan peace have joy. No ill befalls the righteous, but the wicked are filled with trouble. Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but those who act faithfully are his delight. A prudent man conceals knowledge, but the heart of fools proclaims folly. The hand of the diligent will rule, while the slothful will be put to forced labor. Anxiety in a man's heart weighs him down, but a good word makes him glad. The one who is righteous is a guide to his neighbor, but the way of the wicked leads them astray. Whoever is slothful will not roast his game, but the diligent man will get precious wealth. And the path of righteousness is life, and in its pathway there is no death. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our Lord will stand forever. Please be seated. Teach us, O Lord, and prove us. Search us, O God, and know our hearts. With our sinfulness exposed in the presence of a holy God, let us confess our sins corporately unto our Heavenly Father, saying, Most holy and merciful Father, we acknowledge and confess before you our sinful nature, prone to evil and slothful in doing good. You alone know how often we have sinned in wandering from your ways, in wasting your gifts, in forgetting your love. O Lord, have mercy upon us who are ashamed and sorry for all these sins in which we have displeased you. Teach us to hate our errors, cleanse us from our secret faults, and forgive our sin for the sake of your dear Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's take a few moments for silent confession.
Now lift up your heads and hear the promise of God to all who repent of their sins and trust in Christ. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Whoever believes is not condemned, but is pardoned and clothed with the glorious righteousness of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, please take your Psalters. Let's turn to our Psalm of Thanksgiving, number 115, verses 1 through 8. Please stand. Amen. Please be seated. In Luke chapter 12, beginning with verse 13, we read this. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But Jesus said to him, Man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Therefore, let's offer to God his tithes along with our offerings. <laughs> Thank you. 
let's now go before our Heavenly Father in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, the Father who loves us perfectly, without fault, without failure, the Father whose love never waxes or wanes, but because the saving work of Jesus Christ, your love is forever and ever and ever, and we praise you. And so, Heavenly Father, we now come before you through Christ, through his sacrifice and resurrection, and we so rejoice that we have peace with you through your Son, Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, we pray for the world. War, violence, sin, darkness, the list goes on and on. Lord, when, when men and women and children seek to live their lives apart from you, against your created order for life, these things are what take place. War, strife, lack of peace, wickedness, thefts, lies, the list goes on and on. Lord, the world needs a savior. The world needs salvation. And so we pray for the gospel, that good news of Jesus Christ, that it would go forth throughout the world, penetrating into every land, every country, every people with that good news of salvation, that there really is a savior who saves us from what is wrong with us at the very deepest of our being, our sin, our unbelief, our wickedness, our evil. And so, Lord, I pray your Holy Spirit would open eyes to the only way of salvation, would open eyes and soften hearts to turn from sin and embrace Christ as their Savior. Furthermore, Lord, I pray for our missionaries. We pray for Dave and Ann Bennett in Phoenix, the Barrio Nuevo. Oh, Lord, grant them perseverance in a very difficult ministry to people that are um, in deep trouble, addicted to drugs, poverty, um, patterns of sin and patterns of living that they just keep repeating um, things that just make life worse and worse. Oh, Lord, as they minister in a very difficult environment, encourage them and provide for them. And we pray for Ben and Bethel Castaneda and their children. Lord, bless Ben as he as he teaches there in Edinburgh Theological Seminary. And that is he, he plants a church there in Scotland. Oh, Lord, use them wonderfully. Bless them. We pray for D.H. and Emily Henry as they minister to the Navajo Nation up in Flagstaff. Lord, provide for them abundantly. Open doors into the Navajo Nation just as you have done in the past, Lord. It's a, it's a difficult ministry, difficult to to be trusted, and I pray your spirit would just break down all the barriers so that the gospel would shine. We pray for Mike and Robin McMahon, provide for them, enable him to complete his seminary studies, use her as you've been using her to, to equip other missionaries. We pray for Dan and Brittany Smith, their ministry at the University of Arizona, May many students come to faith in Christ. May many grow in their knowledge and ministry of Christ. Furthermore, we pray for Jeff and Heather Vaughn as they minister in that 1040 window and, and as they seek to, to counsel and build up and encourage missionaries that are struggling, them being missionaries to missionaries. And finally, we pray for Aron and Leticia Zapata 
as a minister there in, um, in El Paso, in Juarez, Mexico, bless greatly their ministry, strengthen them, and provide for them. Furthermore, Lord, we pray for Barbara Wolf as she recovers from her surgery, um, her surgery, which is on Friday. Bring healing, see her through this time of recovery. Lord, we pray for others who are who are in need of healing, who are in need of, of just perseverance through great pain and suffering and, and recovering from illness. We pray for those who are struggling with fear. This is definitely a time of heightened fears, Lord. And our fear drives us to listen to many voices, many of whom are not good as they feed our fears. We pray for those who are worried and full of anxiety, who are depressed, who are struggling with addictions. Oh, Lord, deliver them from their struggles. Help all of us in our weaknesses. And Lord, encourage us that even when we're not sure what to pray, that the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And furthermore, encourage us that for those who love God, all things truly do work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Encourage us with this great truth that for those whom you foreknew, you also predestined to be conformed to the image of your son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And Lord, teach us to pray as you taught your disciples, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Well, please take your Bibles. Uh, we're going to be focusing on Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7. But I'm also going to be reading from Genesis chapter 6, beginning at verse 5 through Genesis chapter 7, verse 5. So please stand for the reading of God's word, beginning with Hebrews 11, verse 7. Hear now God's truth, God's revealed truth, the word of God, beginning with Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7. By faith, Noah being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. Now let's turn to Genesis 6 for the background um, for the account of Noah in God's word and for Hebrews 11, 7. Genesis chapter 6 beginning in verse 5. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. And Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh 
had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and out with pitch. This is how you are to make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits. Its breadth, 50 cubits. And its height, 30 cubits. Make a roof for the ark and finish it to a cubit above and set the door of the ark in its side. Make it with lower, second, and third decks. For behold, I will bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall die. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall come into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female. Of the birds according to their kinds, of the animals according to their kinds, of every creeping thing of the ground according to its kind, two of every sort shall come into you to keep them alive. Also, take with you every sort of food that is eaten and stored up. It shall serve as food for you and for them. Noah did this. He did all that God commanded him. Then the Lord said to Noah, go into the ark, you and all your household, for I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. Take with you seven pairs of all clean animals, the male and its mate, and a pair of animals that are not clean, male and the male and its mate, and seven pairs of birds of the heavens also, male and female, to keep their offspring alive on the face of all the earth. For in seven days... I will send rain on the earth 40 days and 40 nights, and every living thing that I have made I will blot out from the face of the ground. And Noah did all that the Lord had commanded him. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. Let's pray. Lord God, um, this is a fearsome account of judgment for sin. So I pray on the one hand, you would convict us of our sin and also enable us to believe you judge sin and are going to judge sin as this is a picture of the coming great judgment. But I pray also that just as here is is a picture of Christ's gospel uh, salvation that you would enable us to believe, that you would even increase our faith in Christ and his incredible salvation from your judgment. So, Lord, work through the preaching of your word. I seek your spirit's unction in Jesus' name. Amen. Faith. In fact, a faith that believes God's word and his promise of, of, of judgment. A faith in things promised but not seen, which endures through thick and thin. A faith which endures through the good times. And a faith that endures as well through the really, really difficult times. In fact, a reverent fear that flows out of a believing obedience, that's the kind of persevering faith which the original audience to whom the book of Hebrews was written, that's what they needed. And that's the type of faith and assurance which we need even today. And to help develop such wonderful endurance and obedience and belief, the author of Hebrews now presents us with the great example of Noah in chapter 11, verse 7. And, well, let's think about Noah and his ark for a moment. Is, is, is not the ark a rather common children's toy? You, you've got the little ark, 
and a little ramp leading in and out and then the animals so the children can can walk the animals up the ramp and place them in the ark and then they can walk the animals down the ramp. But how often have you really stopped to think about Noah and the ark as a tremendous example of faith? As well as have you ever stopped to really think about that ark and the tremendous lesson it teaches about the reality of God's coming judgment? And on top of that, what it teaches us about salvation in Jesus Christ. So you see, the great faith of Noah is included in that that great chapter, Hebrews chapter 11, to help spur us all on to a faith that believes and persevere. As the author of Hebrews writes in chapter 10, verse 36, for you have need of endurance so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. Isn't that beautiful? An enduring faith so that we can receive what is promised in Christ. That's our great need. So let's open by by looking at the the stark contrast between Noah's godly character and the corrupt character of the rest of humanity back in Noah's day. Look at Noah's character, first of all, in Genesis chapter 6, verse 9 and verse 22, where we read, these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation, Noah walked with God. And then verse 22, Noah did this. He did all God commanded him. Wow, can you imagine if that was written of us? Woo! So so what we find here are four characteristics of Noah's godly character. He was a righteous man. He was blameless. He walked with God. And he did all that God commanded him. Again, wouldn't it be absolutely fantastic if this could all be said of you and I? Now, what I want you to understand here is that even in in these characteristics of, of his character, Noah is a type of Christ. While Noah was imperfect in those qualities, please understand and even rejoice in the fact that Christ was truly flawless in being righteous and blameless and walking with God and completely doing all of God's commands. And thus, for all who trust in Christ, well, please understand, we're united to Christ. We're united to Christ in his obedience, in his righteousness, in his walk with God, so that the same that can be said of Christ can be said of us in Christ. And that's beautiful. When God looks at us, he sees Christ's righteousness. And that means that his smile is upon him, upon us. In fact, this is why the New Testament can dare to call us saints rather than continually addressing God's people as sinner. Isn't that beautiful? to the saints in Ephesus and to the saints in in Colossae and so forth. So looking at these characteristics, let's first look look at the fact that Noah was a righteous man. What this means is that Noah sought to love God with all of his heart, with all of his soul, with all of his strength, and he sought to love his neighbor as himself. Secondly, we're told Noah was blameless in his generation. You know, if Noah had sought to run for political office, no one would have been able to dig up any dirt on him. Noah was blameless. That is, he was a man of integrity. Third, Noah walked with God. He he lived in an intimate communion with God. And fourth, Noah, it's mentioned several times here, indicating its importance, Noah did all that God commanded him. God told him to build an ark, and he built an ark. 
Now, in stark contrast to Noah's character, there are his contemporaries. Look at chapter 6 here in Genesis, verses 11 through 12. Whoa, it's, it's terrible. Now, the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. Do you notice that? Corrupt, violence, corrupt, corrupt. The inhabitants of planet Earth then were corrupt. It means they were morally, spiritually disfigured, ruined, laid waste, laid waste in their sin. God's good moral order for all of life was trampled underfoot by the wickedness of man. And so life and civilization itself was corrupted under man's sin. And when God's created world when God's created order becomes corrupted, then peace and harmony begins to become violence. We have only to look at our present day to gain an idea of what some of that violence might have been. Domestic violence. There's shootings, schools, workplaces, in the malls. There's abortion. There's despots invading neighboring countries. Truly, Genesis 6, verse 5, nails the human condition. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of the heart was only evil continually. Our society believes that we're basically good. God, who truly is able to, to look at the human heart at its deepest levels, he says otherwise. Sin is that deep. Sin is that serious. Our corruption is that deep and serious. And only God, only Christ can really deliver us from this. And so God responded to that corruption by pronouncing coming judgment. Verse 13, and God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Now that is an Old Testament shadow of God's coming final judgment of all of humanity. And so it's in this setting of God's announcement of coming judgment and his command to build an earth, uh, to build an ark that we see Noah and his great faith. Back to Hebrews 11, verse 7. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning the events as yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this, he condemned the world and became an heir of righteousness that comes by faith. Now, thinking back to the beginning of Hebrews chapter 11, do you remember how verse 1 goes? Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. The conviction of things not seen. God commanded Noah to build a massive ship, the length of one and a half football fields. He's likely miles and miles and miles inland there's not a cloud in the sky. And there's two main things not seen here in Hebrews 11, verse 7. First of all, there's a warning of coming judgment by, by floodwaters. And second, there's a promise of salvation from that coming judgment by building an ark, inland no less. By faith, we're told, Noah constructed the ark. You know, if Noah had had a television in his day and he had tuned in to, to a weather report, there would have been absolutely nothing out of the ordinary in terms of any long-term weather forecast, right? Things not seen. A, a faith that persevere, perseveres operates in, in the midst of ordinary life in which things promised aren't yet realized, they're not yet seen. Uh, 
a faith that perseveres, believes God for what can seem improbable, even impossible, things not seen, things which lie in the future. That's what promises are about. Things not held in the hand yet, they're future. Again, chapter 10, verse 36, Hebrews, for you have need of endurance so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. So in Hebrews 11, let's go back one verse to verse 6. And without faith, it is impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists. Whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists. Timothy Keller points out something very important about faith. And verse 6, Christian faith is not just believing in God, it's believing God. Did you catch that? Christian faith is not just believing in God, but it is believing God. It's never enough to simply believe that God exists, although that's where faith begins. We have to go further, just as verse 7 then shows us, and believe what God tells us and what he promises and act upon that belief. <clears throat> and so what we mean by believing God is that one must actually obey that belief needs to go into action. We, we need to act upon what God says. Noah, I know it doesn't look like it at all, but I'm going to wipe out sinful man from the face of the earth by a deluge of biblical proportions. And I want you to build a massive ship right here on this spot, far, far from any water, and it's going to take years and years and years for you to construct this ship, and you're going to be mocked, you're going to be derided, you're going to be scorned, you're going to be ridiculed. And Noah did all that God commanded him. So a faith that perseveres not only believes in God, but it believes God to the point that we act upon our belief by faith, being warned, Noah constructed the ark. So in Noah's believing God, that God's going to bring judgment, and that salvation is going to come by constructing an ark, Noah started construction. In other words, by faith, Noah obeyed God, things unseen. And take careful note of what moved Noah to obedience it says in, in verse 11 of Hebrews 6, in reverent fear, he constructed the ark. Now, this was not the kind of fear where one cowers in dread. Rather, it was a hard attitude in which Noah was in awe of God. He was in awe of God. He deeply reverenced God. He possessed a holy respect for God. And he also understood God's a God of judgment, right? Reverent fear. Such an attitude we learn in verse 7 um, lies at the heart of obedience. An obedience that flows from believing in God and flows from believing God. So do you get it? This reverent, um, this reverent fear was no mechanical obedience. This was no reluctant, I guess I have no choice but to build an ark and cross my fingers and hope this all works and I'm not a fool. Again, this was an obedience that flows from believing God and it flowed from, you, maybe you could even say it originated from a holy awe, trust, respect for God. <clears throat> Timothy Keller says, a reverent heart is a holy point of light in a dark world, for it is an obedient heart. I think that's beautiful. A reverent heart is a holy point of light in a dark world. Think of us in our own society. 
It's an obedient heart. Charles Spurgeon observes, Noah feared God as the King of kings and Lord of lords. And when he went about through the wicked world, Noah often said to himself, I wonder the judge of all the earth does not destroy these rebels who dare to be so vile and violent. In other words, an element of faith that perseveres is a reverent faith. It flows from a reverent fear of God. Let's continue working our way through verse 7. By faith, Noah did what? He condemned the world. Isn't that an interesting thing to say? By faith, Noah condemned the world. So how did Noah condemn the world? Well, he condemned the world in two ways. He did it by preaching and he did it by his faith. So first of all, by his preaching. Well, it's very common to reference 2 Peter uh, chapter 2, verse 5. Because there it says Noah was a herald of righteousness. We can imagine that Noah, as he was constructing that ark, that the unbelieving world would come by and they'd jeer at him and they'd taunt him. And likely Noah would respond by warning them of the coming flood of God's judgment. And he would warn them to repent. Come into the ark for salvation. And so Noah was a herald of righteousness. And secondly, Noah condemned the world by his faith. Think about it. By faith, year after year after year, he he persevered in building that massive, massive ark. The ark which itself was a witness of God's coming judgment upon wickedness. And by building that ark by faith, his family was saved by that ark. And the very fact that that built by faith ark saved his family condemned or proved wrong the scoffing, unbelieving world. Noah's very act of faith in building that ark was a proclamation to the world of God's coming judgment. And as those those flood waters rose, the drowning, unbelieving world was condemned. And by the way, have you ever noticed when you're reading the account of Noah's flood in Genesis, who it was that shut the door of the ark? Have you ever paid attention to that? Because apart from what Genesis reveals, I would assume my own picture would be this thick, massive rope attached to that door on the ark. And I can picture Noah and his sons pulling it shut. But that's not what we read In Genesis 7, verse 17, we are told, And the Lord shut him in. It was not Noah who closed the door to that ark. It was God's sovereign hand of judgment over sin and rebellion, which personally closed that door. In this act, God distinguished between the just and the unjust. And in this act, God determined who would be saved and who would not be saved. Closing the door of that ark so no one else could enter in was God's righteous privilege, his duty as God, and no one else's. Those who were drowning had had their opportunity to embrace God's salvation, but they had spurned it. And now it was too late. God shut that door. And that's a warning to all who do not believe. You can't wait around. Today is the day of salvation. This then brings us to the gospel. It brings us to Christ. For God not only judges sin. But he's such a good God that he also provides the way of salvation to all who believe. So let's look further at verse 7 here and note two great gospel truths here. First of all, there's salvation. And second, Noah was an heir of righteousness. So verse 7, by faith, Noah, constructing an ark for the saving of his household, He also became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. So returning to Genesis chapter six and what it tells us took place after God shut the door of the ark 
verse 17, the flood continued 40 days on the earth. The waters increased and bore up the ark and it rose high above the earth. And then verse 21, and all flesh died that moved on the earth. Birds, livestock, beasts, all swarming creatures that swarm on the earth and all mankind. The waters increased. The ark rose above the flood waters and all living creatures, including man, died. So here's the first piece of gospel good news here. The ark which saved Noah and his family, it's a type of Christ. It's beautiful. It's glorious. The ark as a type of Christ teaches us wonderful truths about Jesus and his salvation. Noah and his family were saved from drowning in the waters of God's judgment by trusting in God's provision for salvation. They entered into that ark of salvation by faith. And that ark then safely enclosed them in its salvation. And through that ark then and its safety, they escaped God's wrath and judgment over sin. It's a beautiful picture. And please understand, there is a judgment coming much worse than mere drowning. God's eternal judgment of wrath and the only escape is to enter into the salvation of Jesus Christ. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. That he might bring us to God. So do you see what all this means? The flood of God's wrath over our sins, it submerged Jesus as he hung on the cross. Christ drowned so to speak. He died in judgment. He died so that all who take refuge in him will be safely carried above the waters of God's judgment. See, God is a God of, of love. He's a good God. Those who embrace Christ by faith are safe and dry. Are safe and dry. Christ drowned in God's judgment, so we would never have to drown. It's beautiful. What does Acts 16.31 tell us? And, and again, think of Noah and, and the ark and, and Hebrews 11.7 and so forth. What does Acts 16.31 tell us? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. What did the ark do? It saved Noah and his household. Continuity, Old Testament to New Testament. And so another element of a faith that perseveres is rather than, than joining the world, as the Hebrew Christians were tempted to do to escape persecution, we take refuge from God's coming wrath in Christ, who is the ark of our salvation. And then finally, let's conclude with the second piece of, gospels, of, of gospel good news here. As found in Hebrews 11, 7, Noah became an heir of righteousness that comes by faith. He was not merely saved from the waters of, of, of judgment, but something more take, took place. He became an heir of, of the righteousness that comes by faith. I looked up online the definition of heir, that's H-E-I-R. And the very first definition that popped up was this. An heir is a person legally entitled to the property of another on that person's death. I thought, wow, perfect. A person who becomes legally entitled to the property of another on that person's death. Timothy Keller describes it this way. An heir is someone who got rich through somebody else. Christ lived the utterly perfect God the Father pleasing life from birth all the way to his death on the cross. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. In other words, when you place your faith in Christ who died for us, we literally received as a truly, truly priceless inheritance the righteousness that comes by faith 
that is Christ's righteousness. Holding tight then to this incredible gospel good news that we are heirs of the righteousness that comes by faith also contributes to a faith that perseveres because we realize that the love of the Father as heirs of Christ's righteousness will remain on us forever and ever and ever and never waver. Even if our faith wavers, even if we struggle with doubts. Here's the good news of not simply being saved, but being an heir of Christ's righteousness. Think about this. As Christ is beloved by the Father, so we are beloved by the Father. Remember, a person, an heir, is a person legally entitled to the property of another on that person's death. As Christ is beloved by the Father, so we inherit being beloved by the Father. As Christ is beautiful and precious in the Father's eyes, so we are beautiful and precious in the Father's eyes. As the Father loves Christ forever and without wavering, so the Father loves us forever and without wavering. We are safe. We are secure in the grip of God's love in Christ. And so here's the conclusion of the entire matter. The flood of God's wrath. It is coming. But there's an ark of salvation. Jesus Christ. So don't wait until the waters start pouring down in judgment. It will be too late then. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. You and your household. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, you are, on the one hand, a God of wrath, and rightfully so. Sin is evil. Sin is bad. Sin is wrong. Sin is against you and your, your created moral order. And you rightfully judge. You bring justice. But we praise you that you are also a God of grace and mercy and love and salvation. And we thank you for, for these types of Christ, the ark, Noah, to point us to the great and wonderful gospel truths. Oh Lord, I do pray on the one hand for anyone here who does not believe that you would open their eyes to their sin, to judgment, to their need of a savior. And that you would enable them to turn from their sin and embrace Jesus Christ with a wonderful, glorious faith. The ark that saves through the waters of judgment. And furthermore, I pray for those who do believe that you would use even the, the account, the true story of Noah and the ark and, and salvation and, and inherited righteousness to encourage us all to persevere even more in our faith. And we pray this not only for our hope and our joy, but that we might obey to your glory. I pray all this in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen and amen. Well, let's now prepare for the Lord's table. Please take your hymnals. Let's turn to hymn number 246. Man of Sorrows, what a name.